this is uh, a session that I'm really excited for, and it's a little bit different from most conference sessions and different from all the other sessions that we're going to have at this conference. So let me just take a moment at the beginning to explain what we're doing here and how it's going to work. Thanks, Rick. So, uh, you know, the, a big part of, of what we're talking about in the Grid Edge program in general revolves around the growth of distributed generation and particularly solar. And I think within both the utility industry and the solar industry and you know, everything that's tangential to both of those, there's a big question mark about ultimately how this pans out. What is the role of the utility in the solar market? Um, are they adversaries? Are they friends? How are we going to compensate solar? How much solar is really going to get installed? And how does that influence the grid? So all of these things are interesting questions. And as Rick mentioned earlier, as we were in the lead up to this conference, uh, we were looking at the attendee list and really impressed by the diversity of attendees that we have here. So everybody in the room comes from a, a different perspective. Um, looking at this question, I think most people in the room probably have thought about this a little bit. And so we decided we would run a session that allows you to have some influence over the answer. So the way it's going to work is you should all have at your seat, either on your seat or in front of you, you should have these little clickers. Uh, if you don't have one, look around at the seats next to you. There could be one in an open seat, or you know, raise your hand and somebody else can hand one back to you. But put that in your hand. The way that this is going to work is that we're going to ask a question. It's going to go up on the screen here, and it's going to be a multiple choice question. And it's going to allow you the opportunity to voice your opinion via a vote. So, I'll open up with a question. I'll sort of explain what we're thinking about in the question. And then I'll give you 10 seconds to vote on it. And you'll see a little timer up on the screen that says counts backward from 10 to 0, during which time you can place your vote. You can change your vote if you want, but you can't vote twice. And you'll only get to vote during that 10 seconds. At the end of that 10 seconds, we will see all of the results. And our panelists here will, first of all, tell us their vote. So they're the only ones who can't hide behind anonymity. <laughs> Um, and then they'll also react to what you all decided upon in your own votes. So this is your opportunity to have something of a voice in the conversation. Before we get into it, let me introduce who I do have on the panel with me today, which is a really exciting group of four panelists, all of whom are great friends to GTM and all of whom have spent a ton of time thinking about this question in different ways. So beginning to my immediate right is Micah Myers, who is the Senior VP of Corporate Development at Clean Power Finance. If you're in the solar industry, you definitely know Clean Power Finance. But one of the things that is most, I think, directly related to this particular session is that Clean Power Finance is one of the very, very few distributed solar companies that has engaged utilities, gotten venture investment from utilities, raised funds from utilities. So thinking about the utility solar nexus, Clean Power Finance is right in the middle of it. My answer still might be biased. That's right, yeah. <laughs> uh, Okay, so then imme immediately to his right is Namish Patel, who's the CEO of Gridco Systems. Gridco Systems is a startup, I think you can still say, um, but is making waves in producing technologies that enable higher penetrations of distributed generation. So in the, from a technological standpoint, thinking a lot about what the nexus of utilities and solar is going to be and how we can enable the growth of the solar industry. I'm just giving you all introductions. This could all be wrong, I don't know. Um, but I'm going to do it anyway. So Aaron Marr is next. Uh, Aaron is the Executive Vice President of Strategy and Programs at SEPA, the Solar Electric Power Association, wh whose entire job is to think about the relationship between utilities and solar. SEPA is a, a, a membership-based or organization focused entirely on utilities and solar. So they work with utilities and with solar companies to figure out where things are headed. And er Aaron is also a former APS executive, so he has been inside the belly of the beast. And Lee is still inside the belly of the beast. So Lee Cravat is the director of smart grid and cl clean transportation at SDG&E. Well, formerly. Formerly, I'm sorry. Now, now information technology. That's right, now information technology at SDG&E, um, our host utility, so, and, and still in the belly of the beast, just a different part of the belly. So, <laughs> with that, let's move on to the questions um, and start to get into it. If I'm oh. capable of advancing. I'm really building the suspense here. Get ready. All right, so we're going to do questions in three different categories. 
The first category is business models around utilities and solar. How will the business models of both solar and utilities evolve? The second is more on the technology end, uh, PV integration and technologies around that, what technologies will enable higher penetrations of PV. And the third is a little bit broader, which is looking at how much we expect solar to grow, how big a portion of the electricity mix is it going to be over the next 10 or 20 years. So those are our three categories, and we have a few questions within each of them. So starting with utility solar business models. Remember, don't vote until I tell you. You don't need to have your finger hovering over the voting machine yet. The first question. How will distributed solar generally be compensated in 2020? So putting context around that, that's six years away, it's not that far. Generally is obviously a generalization. But you know, I think there's been across most of the states where there's a lot of solar installed and some that there isn't a lot of solar installed, there have been regulatory battles around net metering. Uh, so what we're asking here is what is the, gonna be the most common outcome of the places where this takes place. Is it net metering as it stands today, net metering largely at the retail rate, net metering with larger or new fixed charges on the bill, this is, the, this is sort of the outcome of the Arizona proceeding or the California proceeding most likely, net metering with a minimum bill charge, which is something that I don't think was talked about as much a while ago, but is becoming an interesting alternative. Massachusetts is now looking like it's heading in that direction. And I'll have some of the panelists talk about this a little bit. A value of solar tariff, which uh, is, there's some factions within the solar industry that love this and some that hate it. It would be replacing net metering altogether. All the power gets fed into the grid and the rate at which you are compensated for the solar fed into the grid is a calculated rate based on the value of the solar power defined by, depending on how you calculate it. Or some other way that hasn't even been talked about yet. So with that, you have 10 seconds to vote. Make sure you vote on this first one, even if you're not gonna vote on everyone, because it'll only count the number of votes that you get on the first question. 10 seconds begins now. And the Jeopardy music didn't work, so you can imagine it in your head. And the results. <coughs> Interesting, so almost, this is, well, I'm gonna start with this. Uh, Micah, you get to go first. Almost nobody in the audience, 5% of people, think that we will have net metering at the full retail rate generally in six years, not a lot of time. What was your vote and you know, what do you think about that? My vote was number five. Uh, I picked other because uh, like most answers, it depends. So I, I think you gotta you know, put some context around the question. So how will distributed solar generally be compensated in 2020? probably exactly the way it is today, which is the primary benefit of distributed solar is offsetting uh, the energy that you would have bought from the utility. So net metering really addresses that, that little bit of tail for net exports, which is really only a factor with residential and commercial largely. You don't have to worry about net metering because the solar is usually designed to replace the load that would have been consumed otherwise. So I think we really get into the question, okay, so what happens you know, to that, uh, that balance of, of energy that's, uh, that's exported out? And the answer there is it depends. It depends on who owns the actual panel. Is it the consumer who purchased the panel? Perhaps they financed it with a loan. Uh, is it a third party owner of that panel? Or is it the utility that owns the panel? And I think that third one, and I'll be interested to hear Aaron comment on this a, a little more, um, that third one gets really interesting because if the utility owns the panels or starts owning more infrastructure you know, behind the meter, I think we're gonna come back and talk, to, uh, talk about the, the physical meter and, and, and how that's positioned today. You know, but when the utility owns, you can start envisioning compensation paradigms that are much more progressive than just a standard net metering. I think if we continue business the way we are today, where third party owners you know, are largely the predominant owners of solar systems in distributed solar, then it's probably going to end up net metering with some form of fixed charge. Net metering is easy for consumers to understand. A fixed charge is easy for consumers to understand. Maybe you have a different answer for commercial because they're a little more sophisticated, mm -hmm. right? We are already do different things for commercial where you have demand charges, et cetera. Uh, net metering plus, uh, plus a fixed charge, and we've seen it in a couple states now, California and Arizona uh, being the, the primary markets. Uh, but I'd, I'd pick other when for When you that say reason. other, so you largely are saying other because you think utilities are gonna be owning a lot of the rooftop solar and thus the compensation mechanism falls outside all of these. 
which is a question we're going to get back to in just a minute, by the way. That may be a lead ahead. Yeah, right. You, you, I should have had you go last. <laughs> uh, okay, Namish, what was your vote and so I, why? So I voted for number two, although I think that the right long-term solution is number four, the value of solar tariffs. But I voted two simply because you know, the, the near-term impact to increasing penetration of PV is at least in part the need for utilities to make certain investments to maintain the reliability of the system in presence of higher penetrations of PV. But that's only phase one, and I think that can be reasonably well covered by an effective interconnection charge, or what we're calling a fixed charge here. If we look longer term, though, and by the way, longer term is already happening in certain countries like Germany, where the investments the utilities need to make are not just about voltage control, for example, and voltage regulation, but it's actually about the fact that the peaks of the export are now exceeding the peaks of the loads that traditionally the utilities saw. This is particularly happening in Bavaria. Uh, in fact, it's, it's so high that the peak exports are now twice the peak loads. So in that scenario, I don't see any other way of addressing the system in a sustainable manner without valuing it in a both time-dependent manner and a spatially or geographically dependent manner based on fundamentals of supply and demand. And so unless you want to see as the utility the need to export uh, and sell power at negative price, which we have seen in Germany this particular summer, you will have no other option but to either curtail or induce curtailment through negative price. Uh, and so I think there's an opportunity in the United States to learn from some of the lessons in, uh, that we're seeing on the ground in Germany and actually jump to the right solution, which has to be a dynamic uh, market-based and supply-demand-based solution to valuing solar. But I think uh, what I see in the regulatory uh, proceedings and the thinking currently biases me to say that in practice we're likely to see number two. Right. So you said you voted number two, but if it were how should sol distributed solar be compensated, it would be number four. Uh, okay, Aaron, what was your vote? So uh, my vote was number five. Uh, I think you two were the two who voted for number five. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly we are, uh, you know, someone else out there voted for number five. Um, and, and actually just to build on the prior two comments, because I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with the fact that there will be um, a larger evolution and many more options, if you will, that, are, that, that we'll see in the coming years. But I importantly kind of grappled with the time constraint you put on there, which is 2020. And so I was kind of in a mesh to gestures. There's a long road ahead of us, um, but I don't think that happens uh, uh, within the 2020 time frame. The reason I chose number five is I believe that there's one missing in kind of your one, two, or sorry, your two, three grouping there, uh, which is likely the, in my opinion, the most uh, palatable by regulators, and that is uh, net metering with demand charges. Uh -huh. uh, neither uh, two or three really allow the consumer to continue to play an active uh, role in managing uh, their total costs. Uh, demand charges send a strong price signal uh, to the consumer. Again, we've seen it in, uh, in the commercial industrial space for many, many years uh, and uh, encourages the consumer to behave more consistent with utility cost structure. So um, had that been there, I might have chosen that option. That's interesting because I mean, it, that makes sense and certainly there's a lot of precedent for that in, in CNI. In residential, you know, we haven't seen that, unless I'm wrong, as the outcome of any of the net metering battles that have taken so place. So the, on, yeah, the only place it's, it, it's been an active dialogue, if you would, uh, was in Arizona. Uh, Arizona Public Service happens to be one of the few utilities nationally that offers its residential customers a demand-based rate. Mm -hmm. Optional, of course. Uh, it's actually demand-based with a time of use integration. So if you think about that rate as a, a potential solution for those to view uh, kind of on a national basis, it has all of the right tools. It has a time of use signal. It has a demand charge signal. Uh, and uh, oddly enough, the dialogue in Arizona, I think, was designed to result in that rate uh, adjusted more correctly, uh, but instead they chose what I would call a standby charge or a capacity right. charge. Um, <clears throat> but it's also important from my perspective to say that I actually don't think that any one of those items can be chosen alone, uh, meaning you're likely to see um, small upticks in minimum bills, uh, you're likely to see um, small upticks in fixed charges and then a demand charge layered on top of that. Again, all as a bridge to a future, uh, which includes uh, what I'll call a more transactive model that allows uh, more real-time price signals, more geographic specificity, uh, and, and all of the, all of the uh, pricing signals that we, I think, all believe are important in uh, deploying the resource, solar or otherwise, effectively. Lee, you're the, you're the utility here. Well, I, I chose number four. Um, but I 
there's elements of all of them that, that are valid. And by 2020, I don't know if we'll quite get there yet for, for the word generally, but I think we'll certainly be on our way. And, and value of solar would be how the distributed solar would be compensated. But really, that's part of a disaggregated rate, an unbundled mm -hmm. rate, not based on kilowatt hours. And so it does use the elements of having a fixed charge, and that would be how you would pay for the fixed elements of the grid. You know, by unbundling one piece would be fixed. Another piece would be a demand charge, because that would lessen the need to increase capacity, right? So, so you would want to encourage people to uh, reduce their use when it mattered uh, to the grid. So for compensation for solar, it's the value of solar, but ultimately it's an unbundled rate that um, allows people to pay the utility for the services that they're getting from the utility. And that's right. two ways, selling and buying the, the services they need. Yep. Um, that's interesting in that my, what I would have voted for if I were allowed to vote here is number three. And no, none of you selected number three. I would have voted for that as how will it be compensated, not necessarily how it should be compensated. But just looking at, I mean, Massachusetts is in the process of legislating this landmark compromise between the solar industry and the utilities for which the net metering portion of it is an extension of net metering in perpetuity in exchange for a minimum bill. And it's the first time that you got the solar industry, all of the solar industry, including the distributed solar companies, with very few exceptions, and the utilities behind it from the start. So given that that looks like a, a model for, I know this is going to Aaron, uh, given that this looks like a model for uh, compromise you could replicate elsewhere, why, why not number three? So uh, just my two cents on that. Um, first of all, the collaboration was uh, landmark. I mean, outstanding collaboration from stakeholders across the industries to have a dialogue and a prospective solution that works. So um, from, from that perspective, uh, uh, Massachusetts deserves accolades. Um, the important missing piece here is we're talking about a legislation that enables the utility to file a minimum bill, okay? Um, arguably a much higher minimum bill. And so that's where the rubber will meet the road. When the mm -hmm. utilities file their minimum bills and all stakeholders, not just solar stakeholders, get a view of what a minimum charge would be from a utility, uh, I think that at that point in time you'll have low income advocates, you'll have a whole slew of advocates come to the table suggesting that minimum bill may not actually be as palatable as they thought it was. And then the tension uh, will result when that minimum bill doesn't accomplish all of what uh, the utility needed to accomplish, um, you'll have, uh, in my opinion, uh, the potential for a rub. Again, it may well work in Massachusetts because it all depends on the load shape and, and, and exactly how much solar will align with the utility's actual peak. But in the Southwest, that's a, that's a, that's right. a tense discussion. Right. Lee, quick response yeah. to that and then so we're gonna move on. So you just said about me being in the belly of the beast. I would say I'm in the belly of the duck. <laughs> and so I think that the, the minimum bill, uh, that kind of thing is a, is a stepping stone to, to disaggregate, to mm -hmm. unbundle, but I think that it really needs to get into the value of solar for solar compensation, mm -hmm. including time of day and time of year. I mean, every, every day is different as to what that value is, and I think that has to ultimately be reflected uh, as we move to more market-based uh, compensation for any of the services. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, the timeline is an interesting piece of this, too. If it's a stepping stone, I would argue six years is, is the time during which you're at that first step, most likely. I don't the, think the, you're the time frame is hard to predict. Right. Okay, let's go on to the next question and get everybody involved again. <coughs> so, next question. So this gets to what Michael was mentioning a little bit before. What portion of rooftop solar installations in the US will be utility owned in 2025? So we're moving the, the timeline out here. So we're about 50, 10 years away rather, 11 years from now. What portion of rooftop solar installations, let's say new installations in that year as opposed to cumulative installations. Shale by energy or, capa or by number or capacity? By, by capacity. Thank you. Are there other caveats that I should be? All right. <laughs> um, feel free to yell them out if I haven't worded these questions specifically enough. Okay, so what portion of, what, uh, what portion of the capacity of rooftop solar installations installed in 2025 will be owned by utilities? Voting begins now. Okay, uh, pretty large contingent for less than 10%, which is saying a negligible amount. Most people seem to think a minority share, uh, but 
something meaningful between 10 and 25 percent, and then it tails off from there. Uh, Mike, I know you've thought a lot about this. Give me your vote and your thoughts. Number five. Uh, a little bit to be prov provocative, um, you know, but I think there's some, some truth to that too. Uh, playing a little bit of a word definition play here, what actually constitutes a utility. You know, Solar City claims that they're the utility of the future. Oh, that's, yeah, that's are they tricky. Maybe? <laughs> okay, I'm oh. cheating a little bit. I'm cheating a little <laughs> bit. You know, but the, uh, the, the opportunity for a utility to, to own rooftop solar or someone own, a third party own and provide a service to a consumer. So consumers like simple. The reason I don't like boast as a long term solution you know, in the previous tariff for value of solar tariff yeah. in, the, in the prior question is that it's not simple, right? It, it varies by geography that the, the value of solar is going to change depending on where you are. It's going to depend on, on things that happen to the grid and consumers don't want to deal with that. They want to deal with, with simple and, and concrete things. And one of the reasons why finance solar is the predominant way solar is sold in, in residential is because they don't have to worry about it. Someone stands behind the delivery of solar as a service for the next 20 years and the consumer doesn't have to worry about uh, who they're going to be paying. They don't have to worry about taking care of the system. They don't have to worry about washing the panels. And so someone is going to own those panels. And I would argue that by 2025, you know, the, the, the utilities who take steps towards competing in this new disruptive space you know, are going to own most of the, so the new solar that's distributed. You know, furthermore, not everyone qualifies for rooftop. Not everyone even has a, uh, a site that's qualified for rooftop. And so you can envision you know, there being lots of distributed solar that may be uh, not very large, like utility scale uh, installations, but community size installations where there needs to be a third party owner that aggregates you know, that generation and provides that through some sort of mechanism to, to consumers. So we happen to believe that, that solar will continue to be sold yeah, as a third party service or as a service in general uh, compared to what consumers, uh, uh, other ways consumers can get their electricity. And so that's why I picked five. All right, let me ask, uh, did any of the other three of you um, on here select number one? I did. We had two of you did. Okay, Namish, why don't you tell us why first and then we'll go to Lee. Well, I interpreted the question to be uh, what percentage of regulated utilities. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, so so, so, I so knew I forgot to the something. NRGs and, uh, yeah, and yeah. the like. And, and uh, however, I do think there's an opportunity for unregulated affiliates of the regulated utilities which to they be are participants, doing which they are right. doing and will continue to do. But fundamentally, I think that the reason for that is uh, twofold. One is that uh, within the regulated framework, there's a fundamental disincentive uh, and misalignment of incentive for utilities to invest in something that's deflationary to their business, uh, at least under the current volumetric sales model that regulated utilities have. The second piece is if we look at the growth rates of the, of the unregulated players in this space, whether that's the solar cities or the sun powers and so on and so forth, all of these guys are competing and they're growing at a uh, 100% growth rate a year in revenue. So these, uh, if you continue to extrapolate that curve, the, he the, the head start that they have will accumulate very quickly. And so unless there are uh, regulatory means for utilities, for traditional utilities to get into this very quickly, I, I can't possibly imagine a scenario where they could get to above 10% penetration. Huh. Lee, you don't wanna own rooftop solar? Oh, I didn't say that. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I do own, well, I'm gonna own well, rooftop solar. You I, I, I just yeah. signed a contract on Sunday, so I'm, I'm good. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, so um, I, I agree with most of what, what you said, maybe, maybe all of what you said. Um, but I took a, a step further. I think um, either Solar City is a utility or it isn't. And I'm going to say, with 10%, obviously, that it isn't. And so even if utilities get, get into the game, it's not going to be put into rates that everybody pays. Hmm. And so, so even if utilities well, well it might it, be they the won't rate base it? Yeah, well, well, it might be a regulated utility. I think it's unlikely. I think it's unlikely that it would be part of rate base. Hmm. Aaron, uh, above 10%. Uh, right. Yeah. You must have been somewhere in the middle, I uh, suspect. I was. I hit number three. I would have loved uh, uh, an option that straddled uh, 50%, but three was my, three was my choice there. And, and, and actually, it's, it comes from a variety of different perspectives. So the first is um, I believe that while a couple of the comments on either side of me are accurate for the landscape as we view it today, the reality is, is the vast majority of the United States isn't seeing distributed solar today at all. Mm -hmm. And so the question becomes, what do you do to enable uh, you know, the 40 states that have nominal amounts of distributed deployment 
And the answer is uh, you allow utilities an opportunity to participate in this space. Uh, and so if you then ask yourself, well, what allows the utility to participate in that space, you can study a variety of different jurisdictions where the regulators have truly played what I'll call kind of Solomon's solution. Uh, utilities propose an ownership solution and uh, the opportunity is split almost always 50-50 between utility and, uh, and independent developers of various sorts. You can see that in California through the original uh, you know, SCE PG&E solution. You can see that in Arizona with the schools and government program. It happens time and time again where utilities can make a strong argument uh, that it benefits uh, all ratepayers to own the asset long term uh, and that ultimately uh, the independent uh, power providers, be they solar cities or, or smaller developers, um, balance out uh, the risk in the future. So let me, let me highlight that because I think it's an important nuance that many folks miss, um, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, that, uh, there's actually an interesting question in that, which is um, will we see these, the numbers be, uh, can you split them out and have very different numbers for a market where uh, there is high solar penetration already versus a market? So let's just say, are California utilities more likely to own a lot of rooftop solar in their territory versus Kansas utilities in Kansas? It's, uh, so I, I, I think the short answer is absolutely. I mean, it, it, there, there's some sense that in California, um, you know, the, the ship has sailed uh, and the market will be crafted in California somewhat differently than it will in the rest of the country. If you ask yourself, uh, what, will it, what will it take to enable a Southern company, a Duke, a Tennessee Valley Authority, to be a significant player in, uh, in distributed solar? Um, I think the answer is allowing them an opportunity to participate in that space. And you're talking about, I think I just listed the three largest utilities in the country. And so uh, uh, those are game changers when they have an opportunity to serve their customer load uh, with products and services that might better match what customers are expecting in 2025. Right. Okay, let's move on to the next question, which is, how will utilities, this relates to one of the points we were talking about a little bit before. Assuming that utilities, I'm gonna throw in a few caveats on this one, I think. Assuming utilities will be making money off of solar and not just suffering from the results of uh, less load growth or no load growth as a result of solar installations, how will they be profiting from solar in 10 years? Will they own the assets and rate base them? That's number one. Will they be selling, will they, will they take over Solar City or Clean Power Finance or Sunrun or whoever's business and offer customers leases or power purchase agreements or even loans and then make their money, you know, either through taking a cut for origination or, you know, owning some of that asset but not rate basing it? Will they make their money through network service charges of one kind or another? That could be demand charges. It could be some other form of network service charge. Is there some other way they're going to profit from solar? Again, this is distributed solar, or they won't. All right, voting begins now. Interesting. Okay, we're going to start at the end with Lee on this one. Lee, what was your vote, <laughs> and uh, how do you feel about how everybody else here voted? Well, um, I, I somewhat agree, actually. I, I was oscillating between three and four to make it random, um, and, and the reason I did that is you tried to define network service charge very broadly, and if it's broadly defined, then I can go with network service charge. Um, you know, really, I see that... Um, you know, utilities, if you look at them as wires companies, so there are other types of utilities, one would argue again that Solar City is a utility. But if you look at traditional utility wires companies, um, I think they're going to provide a market, a trading market for that solar energy. Uh, there was a comment based on Centennial Gas and Electric uh, data, it was very incorrect that most solar energy is used right there, you know, by the, by the home uh, or business that's generating it. We see a tremendous amount of solar especially in the residential market, which is a majority uh, in San Diego, going on to the grid. Um, so uh, that, that has to be transported. We have to balance the system as there's more solar. We're going to be uh, a balancer of the system. There are going to be many services that we provide, storage for that solar. Uh, that's why I kind of played with other as well. Um, so just ma many services that we provide to folks that, that you know, want to wanna be green, want to be environmentally c conscious and have solar. Um, it just doesn't, it isn't all you need. You need all the other services with it. Right. 
So who on the panel disagrees with the another vote, Aaron? So I, I made a liberal interpretation of number one. Um, I think that you're gonna have two aspects that really feed uh, rate-based asset growth in solar. The first is what I'll call the obvious, uh, which is the ownership of the solar asset itself. Uh, so I think you're going to see a, an increase in fraction of that occurring within the regulated utility. Um, and again, here, uh, I, I noted that you chose a slightly different term for this. You did not call it distributed solar. Oh, sorry, you did not call it rooftop solar. You called it distributed solar in your definition. So I think that by 2025, we'll have a prolifer proliferation of kind of these community or shared uh, solar programs where the utility is deploying a significant or more significant sized asset to serve uh, the wide variety of customers that can't install it on their roof. And I believe that those community solars will, uh, solar assets will in some form or fashion be rate based. There's another facet of number one though that I want to highlight because uh, it really dovetails uh, uh, with the comments you made just before me and that is um, that to enable um, larger scale solar deployment, uh, utilities will be investing significantly in the distribution grid. Um, enabling capabilities that it does not have today. And I think that the utilities are slowly beginning to recognize that enabling a platform that allows customers to integrate a variety of different technologies is actually uh, an asset uh, growth opportunity in and of itself. Uh, so to become that entity that can uh, 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 charge for network services, interconnecting the vast variety of technologies we're gonna see in the next 20 years, uh, they'll be making significant asset investments in that as opposed to kind of their pure play vertical look today. Right, right. Um, Micah, you, you sort of indicated before <coughs> that number one would be your selection. Was that indeed the case? That's right. So rate-based asset ownership, it's, you know, Clean Power Finance is a white label platform and so we're fairly agnostic as to who puts capital across the platform to build portfolios of distributed solar assets. And so because of that, we have lots of conversations uh, with utilities. And if I categorize the feedback that we're getting in all of those conversations, you know, it's really that the hard part for a utility to take the step to rate-based solar is having a willingness to do so. So we've had plenty of conversations where they're just in that first stage of, uh, of loss, so the, the denial phase, and they just, they don't want to do anything. They don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to go to the commission. Um, that needs to progress and they need to take uh, an action. It's not that difficult actually. You need a willing utility, you need a willing commission to let them do it. There are a few states who have, uh, who have approved that. Uh, um, uh, Edison owns a little bit of distributed generation already. Uh, Massachusetts has a, a 50 megawatt carve out to do a little bit of uh, a rate-based distributed uh, solar. Arizona has done pilots in the past. So different commissions have let utilities do this. It's just the utility needs to take the next active step and say, we really want to build this in, into the program. And then once there's that willingness and, and approval, putting a program out into the market actually isn't that difficult. So for the utilities who do choose to profit from solar by 2025, it's probably going to be in a rate-based model. Though, you know, I will, I will add though that, I mean, you, you pointed out three examples, but those are all pretty much pilot programs. And then, and some of them have been around for a while. ATS has been doing it for, years, the Massachusetts program started in 2009, I think. You know, it's not like that has then led to them getting into owning distributed solar in a much bigger way. So I guess I wonder why that's not the case, and it seems to me like Lee is waiting to answer. Yeah, I mean, you didn't put us on the list. We, we it, so it implies that we're not willing, and I just want to correct that perception. If it's out there, we, we applied. Um, it's two and a half years now, I believe, for, for, for Share the Sun. Yeah. You know, so communities can do it, and we're still waiting for a ruling on that one. I think it will come, um, so we'd love to do that. Um, and then we also uh, applied for to be able to install in, in neighborhoods on CNI rooftops and so on. And the number that we asked for was significantly cut, and a lot of requirements were put around it. But the desire was there. I mean, it got a little bit, but it's it's not <coughs> it's not primarily profit. You know, is is a small amount of, of money in there. Right. It's not clear to me that rate basing distributed solar by for regulated utilities is even the right thing to do, to be honest. Because uh, the, the more distributed it is, someone someone really agrees. Well, with well, it. well. I mean, the way I look at it is, the more distributed it is, the the, the more intense the equitability issues that arise are. Mm. So, if I'm going to invest in a particular community A, why not community B, C, or D? Uh, nevertheless, if I'm going to rate base it, I'm actually socializing that cost across my entire. Uh, uh, rate payer base. 
So I think there's an equitability issue. I think the, the second piece is, at the end of the day, if, it's, if, if there is a need for generation, for supply, demand, growth, and load growth, then it is likely for regulated utilities to actually find it more economically attractive to do it at large scale, utility scale, than in a distributed way. And so it's, it's not obvious to me that rate casing, is, uh, rate basing this is actually even the right thing to do. Hmm. So a couple, a couple comments just to, just to close this question out. Okay. Not every utility is the same. Actually, every utility is different. They have different businesses and services in their regulated utility business. For example, in, in New Jersey, TSEG owns the largest HVAC um, uh, operating company in the whole U.S. And, uh, and we don't have that in California. California doesn't necessarily have the same relationship with, it, with the PUC, so you actually need a willing utility and a willing commission to let them do that. Uh, the other reason that utility ownership of, of solar makes sense is because we subsidize a lot of costs across the utilities market base you know, anyway. The cost to deliver power in the San Fernando Valley is a little bit different than the cost to deliver power in San Francisco. Same is true for, uh, for San Diego. So but the utility knows where that value is and they can create incentive structures, not necessarily for the off-taker because utilities deliver standardized pricing to all of their, all of their customers, you know, but to the companies that are gonna go distribute it. So put an incentive out there to make sure solar gets adopted and penetrated in those uh, grid congested areas, et cetera. And the utility really is the, the, the sole player that can control that and create a program to maximize the value of solar for all stakeholders, and that's why I think you know rate basing uh, makes sense. I, if that doesn't happen, I think the ability for utility to profit from solar is uh, is definitely minimized, at least in the current uh, paradigm that we operate in today. Right. We're gonna we're gonna move on in the interest of time. I'm getting to enough questions. This one I couldn't I couldn't figure out a way to write it any shorter. Um, so most of you probably know in the audience that Barclays uh, credit rating team recently made a sort of a big move that was real splashy in which they downgraded all electric utility sector bonds in one fell swoop, citing largely the threat of distributed solar and then ultimately over the longer term storage as well, stating that this is a, a, an actual threat to the creditworthiness, the bonds of utilities, um, which is a big, really big move, even you know, bigger arguably than like a downgrade of the stock. So what is your view on this move? And I'm sure there are other ways to put this as well, but broadly speaking, from good to bad, the first, number one, is a good call. This, is, this was correct. Uh, it's already true that utility, utility creditworthiness is threatened by the growth of distributed generation en masse, right? This was all electric utility sector bonds. Number two, yeah, it's true, but it's only for some utilities. So it, it might make sense to downgrade the bonds of SDG&E, but maybe not Oklahoma Gas and Electric. Number three, true, but I, I think it's a little premature. This ultimately will become the, the case, but you know, it's, you can't really make an argument that the, the bonds today are, should be downgraded. And then four, bad call. This is not a threat to the creditworthiness of utilities. It may be something utilities have to deal with, with the commissions or um, in terms of their business model. It is not a threat to their overall creditworthiness. Those are your four choices. Voting begins. And the votes. This is maybe the most even spread that we've had in any of the votes so far. The top selection was true, but only for certain utilities, followed by true, but further in the future, followed by it's a bad call, and then very few people, although you know, a, not a significant minority, believe that uh, it made sense to downgrade all utility bonds. Um, why don't we begin with Aaron on this one? What did you vote for? I, I would have loved a combination of two and three. True for some utilities, but further in the future. Um, and, and the answer there is, um, I, I, I think very simply that in some jurisdictions, the utility will have a very hard time responding to the uptake. Uh, and that that alone will jeopardize some of their uh, traditional assets. And that unwinding commitments to traditional assets will take longer uh, than the response of what I'll call the market innovation, the technology innovation, that will leave some of their revenue collection in jeopardy. Um, again, but in a very narrow set of instances. So mm -hmm. I would love to see that kind of. Two plus three. Yeah. Got it. 
Uh, name it. Uh, so I think I voted three. Um, but I think it may be worth putting this in context for a second. So, you know, over the last three decades or so, uh, the average utility credit ratings have had a slow decline from, you know, double A to triple B or so. And largely that's because of uh, slowing growth of load and demand, right? The issue I have with this question is I actually don't believe Barclays answer or reason for the downgrade is actually the real reason. At the end of the day, credit ratings for utilities are generally good because of the certainty of the regulatory model that they operate in. I, my belief is that the reason for the downgrade is because there's a lot of or increasing uncertainty as to what the regulatory model will be over the next decade or so. Mm. I don't believe it's because DG and certainly not storage actually impacts the revenue, uh, uh, the, the revenue of the utility in a substantive way, albeit for a few utilities that are seeing higher penetration. So I think actually, you know, the piece that's needed here is some more clarity on what the regulatory model is going forward in the presence of DG and storage. I think that will actually give rise to a, uh, a, a, a perhaps a, uh, a slight upgrade of credit ratings over time. Yeah, so the, you're saying the threat is to the regulatory compact more so than, than yeah. directly to utility revenue from yeah. sales of electricity. Micah, and then we'll go to Lee. Sure, I picked, uh, I picked number one, it was a, it was a good call. Uh, the reason I picked that is because even though utilities, we're not going to impact the, their ability to pay down debt in, in the future, but debt to equity for utility, uh, they're incentivized not to have too much leverage, right? There's a, you get a pretty good return uh, on that equity slice, which is, is regulated, so you don't want to lever up too much. You want to create a pretty good capital base in, in your equity and return uh, uh, good returns to your shareholders. Yeah, so we've got a long way to go before a utility is going to default on the payments. But I, I would agree with what was said. Uh, I think it's a good call to sound the alarm and say, look, there is a disruptive technology. There are, there's a set of disruptive technologies which are going to change the regulatory environment and that, that construct and the compact that regulators have with utilities. And so we're not going to tell you which utilities to look at, you know, but in California, there are high penetrations of distributed solar. That's cutting into future load growth, and the regular, regulatory compact could change. And so I think it, it was a good call, and it's not Barclays' job to go utility by utility and figure out where that's happening and, and predict the future, but to generally sound an alarm for, uh, especially coming out of where we were just 10 years ago, right? I think you know credit ratings groups are going to be conservative. Mm. Lee, or you'd hope that they are anyway. What was your vote? Well, you know, a lot of good points have been made. I, I did vote for number two, but I, I thought hard about every one of these, and I could have justified any of them um, for the reasons that have been said. The bottom line is I think m most utilities um, are talking to their regulators and trying to figure this out. Um, I don't think they needed uh, Barclays to do this in order to do it, so I can't go with good call, really. But I think most are finding ways. Um, the regulators know that many, many, many customers <laughs> Majority of customers are going are to need the wires for, for a long, long, long time to come. And so they have to figure out a way to pay for those wires. And so that's how most utilities make a lot of money. Now, again, if you look at utilities that only have generation and they have base load generation, it could be some issues there. So, so that's why I went with some, although I think a few that, that might run into some issues. All right. Okay. Let's move on. The next question, we now get into the second category here, which is PV integration and technologies to, to enable that. So the first question is uh, effectively, and I tried to make this as specific as possible, uh, when does PV become a problem? But the specifics of the language are at what penetration level measured as percentage of daytime minimum load does PV begin to cause serious, and define serious however you will, stability problems on a particular feeder or circuit? Okay. Any caveats I should be giving here? <laughs> Added language. Good enough. Namish, I got it. Okay. Voting begins now. Oh, look at that. Now, this is particularly interesting because I would bet if we, in fact, we can find out. We can't find out now, but everybody come back to the U.S. Solar Market Insight Conference we're going to hold in December, and I bet you if we did this question in front of a sol an entirely solar audience that it would be way higher than that. It wouldn't be number one. It would be at least number 
three, if not higher. Um, Namish, you get to kick us off on this one. What's your vote? Well, I think uh, first the key thing is the metric that you define, so it's percentage of daytime minimum load. So I actually chose th number three, 100%. But the, the real answer here is it depends on where you are on the feeder. So if you're close to the substation, then even if you're seeing PV export equivalent to minimum load, you can see voltage violations on the upper ANSI range. If you're way at the bottom of the feeder, you're likely not to see violations. So uh, you know, the, the there is a strong feeder dependence in terms of location as to where you're going to see this. But I actually think the metric uh, going forward is actually uh, better tied to actually what the absolute uh, power export is rather than percentage of load because load profiles them sen themselves are changing. Mm -hmm. And moreover, the minimum of the load doesn't necessarily correspond to the maximum of the, of the PV or in all cases. And so, uh, but generally speaking, if you're hitting uh, power exports on the order of uh, certainly 100%, you are likely to see issues, particularly close to the substation. Would you comment then on the fact that almost half of the audience selected number one here? Well, to be honest, I actually think that's perhaps b uh, as a function of, the, of the, the metric because I think a lot of people are used to a different metric. Mm. And when they talk about percentage, they actually often will talk about percentage of the capacity of the feeder or percentage of the peak load of the feeder. I think Lee can probably comment more on that. But it may, there may be just a, just a metric. Yeah, OK. Could have been the wording. Yeah. I tried so hard. Lee, what do you, <laughs> what do you think? Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to pretend to be a power engineer. So instead, I'm going to go with the Tom Bialik answer because it, it's just the answer based on actual data that we have. And so I voted for number one because we have seen kind of different than what you said, though. We, we have seen issues at 30% at the end of a circuit, and significant issues, out of compliance issues. It's just factual data that's been measured. So is it, it, it is what it is. Is that, is that the minimum load? Is that the that's when it happens. It, ha it happens when, when we have a minimum load, but a nice sunny day. Well, right. not a sunny day, a good sun, but, but um, the marine layer getting right. burned off mm -hmm. is when we see it. Um, and it plays havoc with our system. Um, however, th the answer overall is it depends because we also have kind of opposite what you're saying again, 100% where we don't have issues because it's close to the sub. And so we, um, um, it's just the data that we actually are looking at and have. Right. Uh, Aaron or Micah, care to comment? Yeah, so so I'll just jump in on one, one quick thought. So I, I actually, at, I embrace the Tom Bialik answer. Um, and that is a couple of things that we observed. So the first is, uh, by the way, I chose number one because you're, uh, again, carefully worded. You said, yes. where does it begin to happen? And it certainly begins at 50%. It can, it, and, and, and it can kind of ramp up from there. Um, and, and the point there being that uh, it absolutely depends. So we've been doing some work uh, for a handful of utilities with EPRI and their, uh, and their value of the grid modeling tool. And again, depending on the utilities distribution system design, you begin seeing issues at very low penetrations as a percentage of minimum load would be one metric um, uh, under certain system design characteristics. And so you begin seeing it at very low penetrations, again, depending very much where it is physically on the feeder. Uh, and then uh, ultimately you have uh, the, the issues ramp up as penetration increases above that 50%. Right, Micah, final note. Yeah, just one, uh, one thing that, that wasn't covered before is the ability to measure. So remember, behind the meter, solar reduces what the utilities perceive as load, unless you're instrumenting you know, all of the, the homes on that circuit, getting the data feed for what the production is and how much you're actually feeding into the consumer's load. You know, it's very hard for the utility to measure uh, that. So I think that uh, you know, the real answer is, is no one knows. It depends, and it's extremely hard to measure. Final comment there. Just to answer that, I mean, you have to use something. And so we're estimating based on the nameplate uh, yeah. of the system in order to determine what the percentage is. OK. All right, <clears throat> next technology-related question. What fraction of distributed solar customers will integrate energy storage by 2020? Again, uh, to add some more language to this one, new distributed solar customers in 2020. So what portion of new? Uh, capacity, define as capacity, to preempt your next question. <laughs> uh, what percentage of new distributed solar capacity installed in 2020 
will integrate energy storage on site. OK. Loading begins now. We have a relatively bearish crowd toward near-term prospects for distributed storage. Uh, who wants to start us off with a comment here? Lee, go ahead. I should say before I give this answer that I've been speaking, you know, I'm no longer a smart grid director, so I've been speaking more for myself as opposed to SDG&E. Right. And I went three, I considered four. And the reason is I think uh, the price is dropping. You said new, otherwise I wouldn't yep. have gone as high. And, and with new, I think the price will be there. I'm not saying that you're going to have enough energy storage um, you know, to, to go off grid or want to go off grid, but to have enough to keep your refrigerator going. Uh, the solar systems that, that I, I'm putting in have uh, 1,500 watts per um, inverter, you know, so I could plug in my fridge. And I think that's something that at the right price, people are just going to say, put it in. Aaron? Well, I'll take a couple. So my, my answer was one, and again, uh, in, in large part because of the wording of the question you said, which uh, customer, I, I read that to be customer-owned uh, uh, battery storage. Yeah. So not, not bearish on storage. I just believe storage will um, play a more minor role at the customer site versus at the, at the distribution substation or whatever else uh, might be deployed. There's a corollary here, though, which would make me answer much higher and that is it will depend on utility rate design and exactly what mm -hmm. it is that they're encouraging. Because I agree that the prices are coming down, and if utilities send demand-based price signals, customers will be motivated economically to deploy solar soon. Yeah, I mean, your uh, answer to that initial question was that we will see more demand charges, okay. which is an incentive for more storage. More storage. Also, I was answering that context as well. Right. That would be that, that other reason. Namish, your answer? So I also interpret it as owned by the customer. Um, but I, I voted for number one simply because, uh, you know, the, the learning curve we've seen on storage, learning curve as it applies to its cost and therefore price, uh, has been very shallow. And I think it will actually continue to be shallow, uh, fundamentally because cost reductions in storage come from chemistry and material science. They don't come from scaling laws. You know, I think it's, uh, there's a number of people that incorrectly assume that Moore's law ap applies to batteries. It doesn't. Moore's law, you get a, Moore's law fundamentally results from the fact that you get performance increases at the same cost. What's the performance metric for batteries? Performance metric is either volumetric, uh, you know, energy density or power density. Uh, there's upper limits on performance for batteries. I think that we're going to continue to see that the learning curve is relatively shallow in, in batteries. And as a result, I think the economics will have some challenges, particularly at the scaling point, as opposed to larger scale. Right. Try to speak down into the mic. Uh, yeah, right. Just put it right up against your mouth there. What do you think, Micah? So it depends on the value prop to the to the customer. I think yeah, if you think about all the the benefits of storage back to the grid or the utility, it doesn't need to be co-located at, at the customer's site. Yeah, but what we do see, especially in California, with the new Solar City offer, uh, which is for fifteen dollars a month, you can get a little bit of backup power. That's being propositioned to the consumer. Yeah, as with a fear tactic. If the grid goes down, your solar system will disengage. It will not produce energy, which doesn't compute for, for consumers. They say, well, why is that? And you need a battery to, uh, to make that make it work. And so we need to put a battery on your, on your system in order for you to have backup power. And that sales pitch is actually gaining traction with consumers. So I picked number three, uh, by the way, you know, based on uh, current market design. So right. commercial customers, managing their demand charges. And for consumers, though, what we do see is growing penetration of storage, or at least uh, the consumer demanding storage for backup power purposes. Even though the last time the power went out in, in, you know, in their utility may have been months or even years ago, just the fear of not being able to have power when the power goes off, even though I have a solar system, you know, is enough to drive adoption. Mm -hmm. And so, with uh, again, with declining prices, uh, and this, this bundled offer, you know, I do see a, uh, an appreciable percentage uh, adopting storage. Great, okay, we're gonna try to do, I think, two more questions with the time we have left. So, second to last one. What will be the most effective, so you have to pick your favorite, mechanism to enable higher penetrations of PV? I'm sure there are lots of caveats here. What penetrations are we talking about? Generally speaking, what will be the 
the primary solution to getting to a penetrations high enough that we start to see those issues at the circuit level that we talked about a little bit before. So additional grid upgrades, intelligent inverters, um, PV inverters, utility volt VAR controls, battery storage, demand side management, or grid power electronics. And I'm, I'm gonna, I have a guess where Namish is gonna vote, uh, given that you're a grid power electronics company, but maybe I'm wrong. Okay, voting begins now. Oh, that's interesting. So the audience at large seems not to believe that we're going to see a lot of energy storage <laughs> installed, but it's <laughs> you're, all very, site. you're all very confusing. Site. Oh, I see. So right. So maybe we can interpret that as uh, storage is going to be storage on the utility side of the meter is going to be the most effective mechanism to enable higher penetrations of PV. Did anyone on the panel vote for that for that reason? You did. I did. Okay. So you agree with the audience. Um, everybody else doesn't. Namish, your vote. Well, as you might imagine, I did vote for number six. However, the reality, at least we've been through this with a number of utilities, is there's, uh, it's always a combination, right? So uh, I do think that grid power electronics is going to play an increasingly central role simply because the, as the intensity of, uh, in, uh, of PV penetration grows, and in particular, as it grows to be commensurate with the loads that utilities have dimensioned their feeders for, that there will be a need for uh, dynamic and long-lasting devices to manage that power flow. Uh, now, with that said, there are uh, good uses for things like smart inverters also, uh, particularly in their pr capability to provide some reactive power uh, and support voltage. But the missing ingredient, I think, actually, underlying all of these is that whether it's smart inverters or whether it's even customer-owned uh, battery storage, there needs to be utility control of those elements. Why? Well, it's the utility's responsibility to deliver power in a reliable and safe fashion. So that the nexus of control needs to be owned by the utility for these pieces. So I think actually what we'll see is a combination of grid power electronics in conjunction with distributed controls and operating systems to manage increasingly unpredictable power flows. Lee, what did you vote here? Um, so the, the answer is all of the above, but yeah. you said favorite or most important mm -hmm. or most likely. Nearest and I say for all of those, number two, uh, intelligent PV inverters. We're, we're already seeing movement on that. A, a, a lot of the if ma majority probably of inverters being installed are, are smart and could do the job. And so but what's really nice about that compared to some of the others up there is that it doesn't force double payment, they're getting an inverter anyway. Why well, have them put an inverter up there and then us having to duplicate technology in order to deal with the issues when for maybe 10% more is what we're being told, mm -hmm. uh, they could deal with it. And, and that actually gets into the idea that as you have more and more solar, it, it just seems like the, the price isn't that much to require certain standards to put the energy back on the grid. And number two for me here would be battery storage because then you can require even uh, to not have the very fast changes uh, in, in output by having some storage with it in addition to the reliability, in addition to playing the uh, unbundled uh, issues, you know, right. and, and, and time use. I think there's number one, intelligent PV inverters, number two, storage with it is pretty interesting as well. Yeah, Ar Aaron, SIPA put out a report not too long ago on the examining the process, and I think I've actually talked to Micah about this too at some point, the prospect of utilities owning the inverter within the PV system, if not the entire system, um, was that a factor in your? It, it was, so, so, so indeed I chose uh, two because of its relative near-term accessibility, if you would, as, as the key solution. It's absolutely fair to say that I would choose, you know, probably all but number five as, as, a, as a leading candidate. Number five is kind of a bit of a mismatch for me, but that, that said, I would have pushed all the buttons at once. Um, but we, we weighed in on, uh, on inverters for an important reason, and actually uh, connects with all the comments said here, is it's our opinion that uh, the inverter uh, looks and behaves much more like a distribution asset than it does a generating asset. And so we think of photovoltaic systems, rooftop systems, as kind of one unit, but in fact, you know, you can kind of bifurcate it. It's really a distribution system-like asset and a generating-like asset. And if we're to enable the capabilities of the PV inverter, 
the utilities will need to communicate with it or can optimize its operation through communication. Um, and then ultimately, uh, uh, if you're communicating with the device, if you're trying to control a device and its interface with the grid, and you're trying to optimize its operation with the distribution grid, um, our paper uh, uh, posed the premise that should they not own that particular asset. Again, it might even be a way to capitalize incentives that are in the market today. There's a lot of motivators to think about that, and at the very least, the important part is to highlight that the inverter is the nexus with the utility, and it might be the nexus that enables additional PV deployment. Right. Mike, I'd care to comment either on your vote or on the sort of utility ownership of the inverter sure. concept? Yeah, I could have picked number two, and we think that a utility, it's one of the features of a utility owned and operated program that you could roll out smart inverters. If you're going to rate base the assets you're gonna create and offer to the consumer, which makes sense, smart inverters could be one of the attributes of a utility provided program. I think it's gonna be very difficult to reach into a third party owned system and start mm -hmm. controlling the production of that system and what it does. Uh, and, and so we'll, we'll see you know, if, uh, if it becomes a feature of a utility program. I actually picked number four though, I interpreted high as in very high and envisioning a world where you actually have an abundance of solar energy you know, during the day. And so ultimately, uh, some form of, of storage uh, needs to be part of that. Yeah, although all the above uh, will all contribute right. you know, to that world. You want final word, yeah, please? Final this. But, but I think we gotta be careful though in uh, thinking that the smart inverter alone is a panacea to solving this problem. Because again, it depends on where you are in the feeder and the type of feeder you have. For example, underground distribution, which happens to see a lot of high PV penetration, particularly in California, because it's closer to the coast, is less amenable to the use of reactive power or, repeat or smart inverters in terms of its support for voltage. Uh, secondly, if you're seeing significant voltage uh, swings, particularly on the secondary, which is ultimately where it matters, uh, again, reactive power has uh, limited ability to actually regulate those voltages to, you know, within more than a couple of percent. And then the last thing, and again, we're seeing this in countries like Germany that have very high penetrations of PV, is that the reactive power as a means of voltage support can actually compound the problems that are to come, which relate more to the thermal management of the system, the thermal capacity of the lines themselves. And so that's what really I was referring to before, which is there needs to be, in addition to the smart inverters, capabilities to manage power and voltage on the uh, primary and the secondaries of the feeders in a much more um, uh, granular fashion and with wide dynamic range. And that dynamic range is the piece where smart inverters are limited in their capabilities to support. Right. So one, one, one thing, just uh, I, I did read this as the issues with intermittency as the inverters. So I yeah. think that, that's how it was positioned on the slide. But we could talk about, and it was a good point just raised, um, really letting solar loose to, to much higher levels than batteries really is what you could set that free and we'll set that free. Right, okay, last question. Expectations for growth. Oh, this is a good one to end on. In 2030, so we've moved even further out now, what percentage of US electricity generation, generation not capacity, will solar comprise? For, by way of context, we're <laughs> under 1% today, slightly under 1%. Um, probably approaching 1% by the end of this year. So in 2030, will it still be less than 5%? Will it be 5 to 10%, 10 to 20, or more than 20%? How bullish are we on solar over the next 25 years? Or, sorry, 15 years. Interesting, so 60% in total said at least 10%, 16% said more than 20%. Um, so I would say overall a relatively bullish group with a few exceptions. Uh, let's just start here, go down the line, and then we'll, we'll close out after that. Micah, your vote. Uh, definitely more than 20%. If you look at distributed solar, we've grown 50% or more year over year for the last decade, and that's not slowing down. If anything, it's accelerating as new markets uh, come into the money. So declining, yeah, the costs in the entire supply chain are coming down, the cost of capital is coming down, and even without a 30% ITC, you can get in the very low uh, double digit uh, kilowatt hour rates with solar today. And so you know, as long as that 
is the case, we will continue to see adoption uh, move up. And so uh, definitely, and remember 15 years, 16 years, that's a long time. Everyone underestimates what can happen in 10 years. And so by 2030, I definitely see you know, a world where we have an abundance of, of solar uh, energy generation. Yeah, I mean, if 15 years ago, the year 2000 or so, we were installing like eight megawatts a year of solar in the US, and, and now we're doing, you know, we did almost five gigawatts last year, we'll do six and a half this year. So, you know, it's true that we've, we've come a long way. 15 years is a long time. Namish, your answer? Similarly, number four. I don't think it needs to measure. I think you know, it's, it's, it's uh, sometimes hard to foresee what the, or intrinsically hard to think about what compounding provides, right? And, uh, you know, the fact that our growth rates have, have accelerated means over a 15 year period, you can get massive increases in penetration. So I think w w with high confidence, more than 20%. High confidence. Mm. All right, Aaron. Uh, one more for number four. Um, and, and just to be additive to the comments made before, I think one of the things that hasn't been mentioned is the fact that well, this was not qualified to distributed solar. This That's is right. just overall. And so as we see utilities um, fuel switch towards natural gas, uh, which is kind of the trend you're, you're likely to see and continue to see for the, for the coming decade, uh, they will find, I believe, uh, that solar provides an excellent uh, price hedge against the potential volatility of a portfolio that includes a a fuel with a volatile, uh, with a volatile price, and so uh, solar will play a natural tool for the utilities as well as all of the customer adoption we're likely to see. Lee, if I oscillated between three and four, I finally settled on three, and it's not because I don't agree with everything said here. Uh, it's because I'm just not sure whether uh, in all parts of the country they can really leverage solar at that kind of high percentage. In California, certainly, you know, we're going you know, to shoot way past this. I just don't know if all markets. Uh, can support it, but I do agree prices down, uh, demand for renewable energy up. Fantastic, and that's a good way to end it. Before we thank the panel, let me just uh, give you a logistical note here. So we're headed into lunch right now. Uh, lunch ends at two, so come back in here at two and we'll be breaking out into tracks. In the meantime, lunch is being held and I think it's called the Banyan Courtyard, which is you go out the doors, um, out past where the reception was, there's a little walkway and then it takes you to another courtyard. There should be signage, but you'll see it happening there. Um, and otherwise, please join me in thanking our fantastic panel for this session.